Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's Elephant Professional Lecture. Today, we are going to go to Myanmar uh, to talk about the elephants there. Myanmar is the country with perhaps the closest uh, population to, or the closest to an historical, historically managed elephant, pop, captive elephant population um, anywhere left in Southeast Asia, um, with elephants living, about 6,000, I think, captive elephants living largely in forested areas, um, able to go out and forage for themselves at night, um, brought in to work during the day, and also using, um, still mostly working within uh, what I would call uh, old style management techniques. So if they're working in say logging, they get days off, they get, uh, they get seasons off. There's a very, very strict rules as to how the elephants should be managed, at least within the end of the year, and in the timber enterprises. Um, and so that makes them an ideal study population for how elephant, mahout elephant relationship or how, how elephants can and should be managed in captivity uh, before a lot of the, the modernization came in. Uh, hi, Beggar, could you, uh, hi Beggar and Jenny, could you mute yourselves, please? Beggar and Jenny, on the side there. Um, so we are going to talk to Carly and Jenny, or Carly and Jenny are going to talk to us. Uh, Carly is going to talk about investigating parasitic infection um, within these Myanmar timber enterprise elephants. And Jenny is going to talk about elephant mahout relationships. I've actually read Jenny's paper, so I know, what, I, know, I know some of what she's going to say. Carly's, I, have to, I haven't read yet. So uh, without further ado, over to you, Carly and Jenny. Great. Thanks very much for that. Nice introduction, John. Um, and I think I can speak for both me and Jen for when I say that we're really excited to be here and to be talking as part of this lecture series, which uh, has been really interesting and useful to watch um, the talks from everyone else that's presented so far. Um, and both of us are researchers within the same project, so we're kind of going to be sharing this talk session, talking on quite different things really. So myself, like John said, on parasite infection and Jen on elephant mahout relationships. Um, and I'm going to be speaking about work that I've done for my PhD from a few papers. And although this is from my PhD work, this is a really big collaborative effort with a lot of other co-authors. And I'm actually now um, a postdoc researcher working within the Myanmar Timber Elephant Project, which is now based at the University of Turku in Finland. But I actually started with the project as a PhD student um, when the project was based at the University of Sheffield in the UK. So I've, I've been working with the project for a relatively long time. And the Mia Martin Elephant Project studies questions investigating a range of different things to do with Asian elephant health and behavior and evolution and ecology. But the project also aims to help inform elephant management and welfare policies both locally within our sites in Myanmar, also trying to have more wide practical applications to other semi-captive and captive populations. And the project includes a number of team members that are spread across Europe, as well as obviously in Myanmar, in Yangon, <clears throat> and locally at field sites. And these staff include project managers, vets, veterinary assistants, students, and other staff that we work with and collaborate with. Me and Martin Elephant Project focuses on a population of semi-captive Asian elephants working in the timber industry of Myanmar, Burma. And Myanmar is actually a really important place for Asian elephants because it's the largest, it's home to the largest captive population of Asian elephants in the world. And the working timber elephants are thought to make up just over half of this number. But it's also home to the second largest wild population of Asian elephants globally, although these estimates vary a bit depending on the source. But it also links other key areas in the Asian elephant range, such as India and Thailand. So it's a great place to be able to go and work. And these elephants are classed as semi-captive because they work part of the time in logging camps during the day, pulling logs that have been felled through the forest with mahouts, as John mentioned but they spend their nights freely roaming unsupervised in local forest habitats. And here they're also free to forage and to interact and mate with wild elephants as well as other semi-captive elephants. And because of this, they're much more reflective of wild populations 
than fully captive zoo elephants, for example, in terms of their natural rates, like their lifespan, their survival and their condition is much more comparable. And what's really important for me is also really likely to harbor the same parasites and experience the same routes of transmission as local wild populations. And there are roughly 3,000 empty elephants at the moment that are working within the timber industry or the Myanmar Timber Enterprise or MTE. And these are divided across different regions and divisions across the country. And each of these divisions are overseen by a trained vet. And the vet gives the elephant basic checks every few weeks and provides mainly restorative care. And they're also primarily responsible for record keeping. And the foundation of the project is really in these records that the vets have kept. Um, every elephant has an individual ID number, which is marked on their haunches or their bum, meaning that all the individuals are accurately identifiable. And every elephant is also issued an individual logbook. And in these logbooks, the vets can record really detailed information throughout their lives on their dates of birth, or if they've been captured from the wild, their dates of capture, when they've died throughout their lives, when they've had health or illnesses or health problems, um, and for females, their pregnancies and calving events. And this has since been digitized into a big electronic database. And this is really great from a data's perspective because it means we have about five generations worth of data on these different elephants to answer the questions that we study. And because the elephants are semi-captive, we are actually able to go and collect a wide variety of biological measures from them as well, which is really rare, um, as many of you I'm sure will appreciate for such a large long-lived mammal. Um, and this includes measures on blood chemistry and other physiological health markers, measures of body condition and um, from weight and other morphometric measures, as well as data on personality and behavior. And we also collect fecal samples, which we can use to assess hormone levels and importantly for me, um, parasite infection. And I am generally interested in how infection dynamics are associated with differences in other elephant biological characteristics or traits. <clears throat> but for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna briefly just show you the main results um, from my PhD on how infection in a sample of the empty elephants was associated with differences in elephant age. So how does infection change for hosts over their lifetimes? Um, between the sexes, how does infection operate differently for males and females? And then specifically for females, how parasitism associated with their reproductive rates? And so I might sort of slip into a few kind of jargony terms um, throughout the talk. So just so that everyone is clear by what I mean, and apologies if you're already familiar with some of these terms. But a parasite is an organism, an organism or a living thing that depends on another organism or a host to survive. And this is always at the benefit to the parasite, and it's always at a cost to the host. And the host can be any organism, um, generally, which pa the parasites can infect. But here I'm obviously talking about elephants. And I'll also mention parasite load, um, which can be used quite broadly. Sometimes this term has different interpretations, but here I mean it as an estimate of infection per individual host or per individual elephant. So this is a sort of count of different measures of um, parasites. It could be a count of eggs or larva or worms, but here I count um, eggs as I'll explain a bit later. And finally, susceptibility. So again, this can be interpreted in slightly different ways. Um, the susceptible means to me throughout this talk, having more risk of having higher parasite loads, suggesting that they're more likely of becoming infected compared to other hosts. And when I say parasite, I'm specifically talking about nematodes or roundworms, which is mainly what I study. Um, and of these, we mainly see within the MT population, strongyloides and strongyl species, which are among the most common gut parasites found in Asian elephants. And these worms exist throughout the gut and they reproduce there and expel eggs, which come out with the elephant's poo, and these hatch outside the body into larva. And then these larva go through what's called three molts, 
um, and then they can crawl to nearby vegetation and they get eaten when uh, another elephant comes by and forages. So we see this horizontal transmission from one elephant to another, um, from the eggs coming out with their poo to when they're ingested with forage. And these parasites can really hurt the elephants and harm them in a number of ways, but the most common of which is by directly leaching resources and nutrients from ingested food matter, but they can also cause massive tissue damage, especially if they're present in really large numbers and take up a lot of space and block the passing of digested food throughout the body. And so I estimate parasite loads um, by counting eggs, as I mentioned, from repeated fecal samples. And these are taken from known individual elephants, recognizable by the ID numbers. And we do this over a longitudinal time frame. So the total collection that we have um, spans from 2013 to 18. And this is really important, especially with our system, because we can take into account different variation that we see in parasite infection rates due to just differences from different years and within different seasons. Um, me and my experience is really strong seasonal differences from a really hot and dry season, followed by a monsoon, and then a cold season. And this can really influence infection dynamics. And so we take a small subsample of their poo and put that into a salt solution, which lets the eggs float. And then we can count them underneath the microscope using a specially designated slide. So we carry out what's called a fecal egg count. And we can then convert this into a measure of EPG or eggs per gram of feces to give an overall estimate of nematode load at the time of sampling. And then we can relay this information that we see um, to local vets and managers, and they can use this if they like to, for example, adjust treatment regimes if necessary. Um, as these elephants are all dewormed approximately twice a year, according to national guidelines. Um, and then these can be adapted to suit the management of local elephant camps across the country. And generally, it's really important to find out which individuals within populations might have higher parasite loads. As within uh, nature, it's a really common finding that parasites, particularly nematodes, are what we call aggregated or just clumped within host populations. Um, so the majority of parasites are normally found within really few hosts. And most hosts within a given population show really no parasite loads or no parasitism whatsoever, at least on an observable level. And it's important to find out who these high uh, FEC or high carrying hosts are, because if they suffer from really steep health declines as a result of these infections, that's obviously bad on an individual level, but it can also be bad um, from population level as the selective disappearances of these hosts, if they might die from infection, um, could be bad and disrupt population dynamics if they're, for example, juveniles or reproductive females. So this can obviously affect the management of captive herds and lead to population crashes in the wild in really extreme cases. And so work that I did early on in my PhD um, found that parasites are actually a really important driver of mortality in our elephants, at least historically. Um, and certain elephants are known to die more of parasite related causes. So this was using the logbook data, approximately 4,000 records of elephants that had either died or that had been censored up until a certain point as being alive. And we looked at their relative mortality risk of dying of either parasite associated causes. So these were either directly listed as due to parasites, so like worms and flukes, or those that were really highly symptomatic of parasitism. So bloating or really severe diarrhea, um, or the deaths had been classed as non-parasitic. So accidents or elephant-elephant conflicts, for example. And all of these deaths were classified by vets um, at the time of death or very shortly after in the field. And we found that calves and elderly adults and males, and really interestingly, non-reproductive females that hadn't given birth to a calf were more at risk of dying of these parasite associated causes than adults in their middle life, than females generally, and then within females compared to mothers. So I wanted to find out whether this was reflected in the current infection rates in a small sample of uh, living MT elephants. 
and I won't get too bogged down um, in the analysis, but we can chat about that afterwards if you're interested. Um, but basically, I was able to sample a lot of elephants, over 300, um, within a five-year study sample site. And I did about 2,000 fecal egg counts. And because of this sort of longitudinal design, collecting from repeated individuals over the five years, it meant that I could control for other covariates such as season, different camps, um, the deworming treatment that the elephants experience, and we could factor that into our modeling approach. And I guess unsurprisingly, I found that infection does vary um, from elephant to elephant. And this is a plot showing the uh, parasite load in terms of fecal egg count on the left hand axis and how this changed with different elephant ages. Um, and generally, although the range of infection was really high, the average infection was quite low. The average infection was about 200 EPG. And from this and later analysis, for our population, we roughly separated infection into three kind of broad categories. So we classed everything as under this, as under 200 EPG as low, a moderate level of infection from 200 to 500 EPG, and any elephants exhibiting um, fecal egg counts over 500 as being symptomatic of high infection. Um, and these values actually do correspond to equine veterinary guidelines, but it's quite important, I think, to note here that this is likely to vary from population to population. Um, and this does require still further confirmation from veterinary studies. So if you're interested in using this information for uh, any other elephant populations, I would use these as more rough guidelines than definitive final categories. And what this plot really showed was that there was what's called a quadratic relationship with nematode load and elephant age. So infection and load was really high for juveniles, specifically those under 10 years of age. Um, it then dipped for adults in their middle ages and then started to increase again at older ages um, with elephants towards the end of their lifespan. And this is kind of what we expected really because increased infection is really common in juveniles and in elderly adults in other vertebrate systems. Um, and this is generally thought to be due to underdeveloped active immunity in early life and then reduced immunity or immunosenescence in later life with increasing old age. However, what was really interesting and quite opposite to what we expected was that infection was similar between males and females. So females are here in blue um, and males are in black. And this was basically surprising because not only did we find that males die more of parasite associated causes in our earlier analysis, but usually in other animal populations, males generally have higher parasite loads as well, although that's not a universal finding. Um, so the fact that males and females had similar FECs was a bit weird, and we still don't really know why this is. Um, we have a number of theories, perhaps other factors more strongly influence nematode infection in our population, and these could override any susceptibility differences between males and females. Um, possibly this could be due to differences in social grouping between our population and what might be seen in the wild. Um, and also there could be differences in other parasite species that we've not captured. It's here, we've only really seen strong girls and strong -oides. And finally, we looked at several measures of female reproduction. So whether a female had ever had a calf within their lifetime, um, whether they'd ever produced a calf within five years, uh, of sampling and their lifetime reproductive success. So how many calves they produced up until the point of sampling. And finally, whether they were pregnant or not at the time we did the analysis. And we expected because there's obviously a really heavy cost of reproduction to elephants, um, mothers spend two years in gestation and then three to five more years producing milk until a calf is weaned. We thought that infection would really be higher for those investing in reproduction and for mothers than those that didn't. But we found no significant difference for any measure of female reproduction. So we basically found no difference between um, mothers and non-reproductives in terms of egg counts. Again, this was really surprising. And in fact, although it wasn't a significant difference and not super obvious here, 
but infection was actually higher on average for females that had never reproduced at the time of sampling compared to mothers. And again, this is a bit of a mystery to us. Um, one explanation could be that females in poorer health invest more in uh, survival and delay reproduction if they're faced with really heavy parasite loads. So in these circumstances, only better quality females would reproduce. Um, but really there should be data and studies within this area before we can say what's exactly going on. So to really quickly summarize, we found that nematode parasites show clear associations with different elephant traits. Um, and we, could able, we were able to categorize infection in our population into three very broad general categories. We found there was clear associations with host age. So elephant juveniles and elderly adults not only died more of parasite associated causes, but they also carried the highest loads. Whereas it was a bit more complicated when it came to elephant sex. So males had a higher mortality risk, but males and females actually carried similar levels of parasites. And finally, uh, a very unexpected finding in terms of reproduction in the fact that non-reproducers had increased mortality risk and in fact uh, females that had never had a calf had also higher infection rates. And this has potential applications for elephant management and welfare, including these tentative categories um, that we suggest using as a starting point to inform any health and welfare practices um, and checking those within different populations. We would also suggest that blanket deworming, um, so treating all individuals within a population in one clear sort of sweep is really unlikely to work. Not only is it probably inefficient um, and expensive, but just by treating everyone in one go, relevant of how infected or not an elephant might be, you're also really likely to drive increases in parasitic resistance to any drugs you're using if you do this on a regular basis. So instead, we'd suggest spot testing different individuals and using a more um, targeted deworming approach. And we'd suggest to particularly focus on the at-risk individuals within a population. So to do egg counts and find out who these are. Um, as I said, there's likely specific differences between populations. But for ours, as a starting point, it's juveniles under 10 and any elderly adults over 45 or 50. And for those that maybe are at risk of dying of parasites within different locations, we would also spot check males. And if we were looking to increase uh, reproductive rates, we would try and see if regularly deworming non-reproductive females assisted with that. So thanks very much. That was a, a brief whiz through of my PhD. And now we're gonna move on to Jenny's talk and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Carly. Um, let me just get my screen up then. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, hello everybody. Um, work. So um, I'll now be moving on to focus on a slightly different aspect of the elephant's lives. Can I just check, Carly, that you can see my screen there before I start? Yeah. Um, and that is the relationships that they have with their traditional handlers or their mahouts. Um, so I'm Jenny and I work in the same group as Carly um, in the Myanmar Timber Elephant Project. Um, and I'm just finishing my PhD actually, looking at these mahout elephant interactions. Um, and today I'm going to be focusing a little bit, explaining first why um, I'm actually interested in these interactions and these relationships between elephants and their mahouts, um, what they actually look like in Myanmar in the modern day, um, and then finally how these relationships between elephants and their mahouts actually seem to be influencing um, the elephants in the mahouts' care. So I actually started working uh, with um, within this Myanmar Timber Elephant Project uh, back in, I think, 2014 now during my master's project. And I was actually working on something completely different. So I was looking at the reproduction of elephants and how it relates to their size. Um, but we sort of started to realize that we were looking at all these different aspects of the elephant's lives. Um, and there was people studying lots of different measures like their reproduction, 
their stress and health parameters, their parasite loads. And we were looking at these in terms of lots of different areas of variation from the season of measurement, the elephant sex, their size and their age. But we seem to be missing one quite important aspect of the elephant's lives. And that was their interactions that they have with their mahouts. So within MTE, each elephant is cared for by one mahout and they are um, specifically responsible for the elephant's everyday care. The elephants live in groups of about six um, elephants and their mahouts and they have one overarching head mahout who has a lot of experience, but it's really the, their own mahout who is responsible for their everyday care. So they will collect them from the forest every morning. Um, so as Carly said, the elephants are released at night to forage. So every morning the mahouts will go and collect them from the forest. Um, they will then take them back to the elephant camp um, where they'll have a good bath, uh, where the mahouts really scrub them down, check for any sort of wounds or parasites or anything like that. The elephants have a really good drink. And then they begin the working day. Um, and the mahouts are really um, constantly checking on that elephant during the working day. So they should be uh, checking that gears well adjusted, that the elephants are capable of the tasks that they're undertaking, and uh, that they're getting adequate breaks and things like this. And then at the end of the day, they release them back into the forest um, at a good foraging ground. And throughout all of this time that they're spending with the elephants, they're constantly monitoring um, different aspects of uh, their behavior. So they're looking, for example, um, to check whether they've slept overnight um, so they can see if there's any areas of the forest where they have uh, laid down, constantly monitoring their diet, any health um, like issues that they can see, their defecation habits, their behavior. So for example, if they notice that their elephants are particularly fatigued or um, aggressive or something like that. And then they feed all this information back to the vets and the head mahouts um, when they do see them. So although the elephants have this whole team of people uh, working to care for them, it's really their own mahouts who are seeing them every day and would notice any abnormalities or any issues. But there have actually been changes to this mahout elephant relationship documented across Asia. So there's been uh, reports of changes in India, Laos, Nepal and Thailand. And this is also often linked to the sort of prestige of working with this sacred animal lessening um, and also the shift from the sort of primary use of elephants being in logging activities or draft work and, and moving towards more sort of tourist based activities. Um, and this has come in combination in a lot of places with mahout salaries um, being a little bit lower and other jobs becoming more accessible that offer higher salaries um, becoming more accessible and more appealing to traditional Mahout families. Um, there's also some evidence um, that tourism in particular does seem to appeal to younger Mahouts um, who don't necessarily come from um, a background of elephant handling and won't necessarily have any experience working with elephants. Um, and this could be an issue um, when the passage of Mahout knowledge and expertise does seem to rely a lot on sort of apprenticeship and training over many years. Um, rather than active teaching. So traditionally a Mahout would have learned from his father or another experienced Mahout over many years sort of gradually picking up um, knowledge um, rather than having a sort of active teaching just before being paired with an elephant. And it's been well well shown in the in the literature um, on studies of animals ranging from livestock, zoo animals, laboratory animals and even in pets and I'm sure you'll appreciate that if you, this if you have a pet, that the interactions that they have with humans could be really important. Um, and generally studies have shown that the interactions that animals have with humans influence their uh, fear of humans, and this influences their stress response. And this, this really depends on the familiarity of the person that they're interacting with. So for example, there was a study done on clouded leopards in zoos. Um, that looked at their fecal corticoid levels, which is a stress hormone involved in, a hormone involved in the stress response. Um, and they found that the leopards had lower fecal corticoid levels when they were spending a lot of time with keepers that they were very familiar with, compared to leopards who were spending lots of time with different keepers who they, who they didn't know so well. So it seems like the, both the familiarity of the relationship and the stability is really important here. 
And it has generally been believed and stated that Myanmar is home to, uh, has sort of the last stronghold of uh, traditional Mahouts and traditional or ve very good Mahout knowledge. Um, so for example, in Richard Lair's book, he wrote, the surviving elephant keeping traditions are severely threatened everywhere except probably Myanmar and Northeast India. Um, and similarly in Sukumar wrote, um, only in Myanmar has the timber elephant retained its original character along with the traditional skills of Mahouts in handling the animals. Um, and these books were both written a little while ago now and there's been big changes in Myanmar over the last uh, couple of decades that could have affected this Mahout way of life. Um, and this may not be the case anymore, but we're not really sure. So when I visited the MTE camps in, uh, for, for the first time in 2016, um, I, I did notice there was a lot of variation in the Mahouts that I did meet. Um, so there was um, a lot of experienced older Mahouts that I did meet, but there was also a lot of elephants who were paired with um, young Mahouts who hadn't worked with elephants for very long at all. Um, and when I talked to the vets that we work with um, in Myanmar, they did mention that it can be difficult sometimes um, to work with Mahouts who are either un uninterested in the elephants they're working with or come and go a lot from the job um, between being a Mahout and other, and other jobs as well. So we set out to just firstly understand what the modern day Mahout elephant relationship looked like for the MT elephants to try and actually quantify this um, and to also compare how it looked in the past, uh, compare it now to how it looked in the past. So whether the assumed traditional system is still in place. So our colleagues in Myanmar interviewed over 200 current Mahouts um, working in MTE and 23 expert elephant managers who've been working with the MTE elephants for at least 10 years um, to see if they'd witnessed any changes in the time that they've been working there. And we asked these um, questionnaires in the Sagai region of Myanmar, which is home to the largest population of the MTE elephants in the country. And straight on to the results here, uh, what we, the, the experts had perceived there to be differences um, in the last sort of decade or so. So they um, perceived past Mahouts to have been older, um, more experienced, and to have spent longer in the job than today's Mahouts. But despite this, they interestingly also um, perceived elephant treatment to have improved um, in recent years, uh, despite these changes. And when we looked at the um, results of our interviews with um, current day Mahouts, these supported these perceptions. So uh, current day Mahouts were on average only 22 years old, with three years of experience in total working with elephants and an average relationship length of only a year with their current elephant. So it seems like not only are Mahouts not spending so long in the job, they're also changing elephants quite frequently in this time as well. Um, a little bit more background information. We found 17% uh, of the Mahouts we'd interviewed had spent any time as an apprentice and only for an average of two months. Less than 50 uh, and so this was before being paired with their own elephants. So um, the rest had just been paired immediately with an elephant. Um, less than 50% of the Mahouts we interviewed had a family connection to elephant handling. And on top of this, only 29% um, thought that their sons would follow them into the profession. Um, so it seems like the family connection to elephant handling is likely to um, decline even more in the future. And when we were talking to the vets about um, the findings that we, we'd seen um, and about why they might, might have been, um, they, they mentioned that the Mahout salaries um, might not uh, be very competitive. So they estimated that in their region, a Mahout would be expected to be paid about $120 a month. Um, and there was a nearby gold mine that would um, be offering a salary of about $300 a month. So it seems like perhaps it's it's not necessarily very competitive against other jobs that are um, av available in the area, and it might explain why we see Mahout sort of coming and going between um, being a Mahout and other professions as well. And they also pointed out that it's more than that; that actually being a Mahout is really um, 
you have to dedicate your life to actually living in the forest with your elephants. Um, um, because the elephants need to be close to their foraging grounds in the forest and often that can mean being quite deep in the forest um, and and so they really have to choose between either living away from their families in towns and cities or to bring their families to live with them in the forest but then their children might not be able to access education quite so easily things like that so they actually pointed out that there's certain technological advances that have happened in Myanmar in recent years that have been really beneficial to this situation. Um, so, for example, things like uh, mopeds, mobile phones and solar panels have only really become accessible for the general public in Myanmar quite recently. So, for example, in 2011, SIM cards were so expensive that less than 2% of the population had mobile phones. Um, but by 2016, this was um, up to almost 100% of the population. So these changes have really happened very recently, but they've really improved the situation because now mahouts can live or can leave their elephants deep in the forest at good foraging grounds, but still access towns um, and still keep in contact with their families. So I just thought this was quite important to show uh, how important it is to talk to the vets and other people who are actually living um, in these situations um, because I think a lot of people in the West would see this right hand picture and think that it looks very idyllic and actually any changes to this um, traditional way of life would be a bad thing, but actually it's a lot more complicated than that. Okay, so the next step was to look at how these changes that we have seen in the Mahout system seem to actually be influencing the elephants in the Mahout's care. So we might assume that these shorter relationships um, must be having um, a bad influence on the elephants because we'd expect that less experienced mahouts um, might not have as much knowledge and experience to actually uh, provide um, good elephant care. But actually it's also been suggested in past studies that um, caretakers can actually become tired of their duties over time and complacent. And it could be that actually having new younger mahouts um, coming into the profession could bring a sort of renewed energy and enthusiasm for the job um, that could actually make up their inexperience. So one of the big benefits to studying these elephants, as Carly already talked about, is that we can get really close to them and we can collect samples from them to um, monitor things like their physiology. Um, and they also have these logbooks which record really important information like their reproduction and their health. But importantly for this study, they also um, write down information on the mahouts that they're paired with as well. So in order to understand how the Mahout relationship influences the elephants, we first found out how much, how, how long Mahouts have been paired with their elephants and also how much total experience Mahouts had working with elephants in the past. Um, and we looked at these two different measures um, in, or, in order to sort of separate out specific relationship lengths from total experience. So it could be if an elephant had been paired with their Mahout for only a year, their mahout may only have been working with elephants for that one year, or they could have a past experience of 10 years with other elephants. So we wanted to sort of tease apart these two different things to see whether specific relationships were more important or whether it's more about sort of total experience and knowledge of, of handling elephants. And we got this information both from uh, the elephants logbooks again, um, and also more interviews with the mahouts to get a bit more information. And we then wanted to look at how these mahout measures then influence the elephant measures. So we first looked at a couple of uh, measures of elephant physiological stress. And we looked at these both uh, a measure in the feces, which was their glucocorticoid metabolites, which is um, this uh, a hormone again involved in the stress response, as I talked earlier. And we also looked at the heterophil to lymphocyte white blood cell ratio, which um, again is known to increase in response to stress. And then we looked at a couple of measures of a more physical stress in their blood. So we looked at their creatine kinase levels, which increase with muscle damage. And we also looked at their white blood cell count, um, which um, shows an immune response. So if they have high counts, then um, it can be a sign of something like infection or inflammation. So straight onto the results here, um, when we looked at the measures of physiological stress, we didn't see any evidence that an elephant's physiological stress was linked to either their specific relationship length with their mahout or their mahout's total experience level. And this was true both in the measure that we took from the feces and the measure that we took from the blood. 
Um, and this could be reflecting a couple of different things. So it could be that the elephants are just reasonably well buffered to the Mahout factors. So perhaps the Mahout system in Myanmar has enough remaining knowledge um, and expertise that even if an elephant's own Mahout doesn't have very much experience of working with elephants, they're still receiving enough training and advice from um, more experienced head Mahouts um, and people like that, um, that they can still maintain good quality care. It could also be that other aspects of management are more important. Um, so past studies have found that um, things like an elephant's diet or their enclosure type and their working hours are particularly important for elephant physiological stress and all are really well regulated in MTE. So they, they forage for themselves in their natural environment. They're not kept in any enclosures and their working hours are, are well regulated as well. Um, so it could just be that, that these things are more important. Um, but it could also be something else, which is that we actually don't see that many elephants that have very long relationship lengths. So I'll show you a figure here. Um, and what you can see is that we have a lot of data points clustered in the left hand side of the graph. Um, and this is at the shorter relationship lengths. And it's the same for the Mahu experience as well. So we actually don't have so many elephants in this right hand side of the graph, which is the longer relationship lengths or the, the more experienced Mahouts. So it might just be that we actually don't have enough elephants to compare to to see any differences here. So it'd be really interesting to look at these kind of measures in other populations under different management settings um, and that might have more experienced uh, or longer relationships as well. Um, so on to the measures of physical stress. Um, we did find that the Mahout relationship measures were important for these. Um, so firstly, looking at creatine kinase, which was the measure of muscle damage. Um, this was dependent on an elephant's relationship length with their Mahout, but this in turn depended on the age of the elephant. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, but basically what we found was that their muscle damage decreased when they had a longer, a longer relationship with their own Mahout. But this was only the case once the elephants reached the age of 18 onwards. You can see in these darker colours here, it starts to decline. Um, and we think that this is likely because the, the relationship between the elephant and the Mahout becomes very important when they're working together. So once um, they're working together, it's really important for them to have that sort of trust and understanding um, between them so that the Mahouts can actually mitigate any negative effects of the work and actually sort of adjust the work um, according to the, their elephant's um, capabilities and behaviour. However, when we looked at the measure of Mahout's total experience, we actually saw the opposite effect. So we actually saw that muscle damage increased when uh, their Mahouts were more experienced, which might seem a bit strange, but what we think this is probably reflecting is the fact that um, it's only the more experienced Mahouts who would be involved in harder logging tasks um, and carry out the most difficult logging work. So we think that this is likely reflecting that. It could also be um, reflecting Mahout complacency over time. Um, and it'd be interesting to look at this further as well. On this, with the second measure of the um, physical stress, which is the total white blood cells, um, which was related to their uh, immune response. We actually didn't see that this um, was linked to their specific relationship lengths with their Mahouts, but we did again see um, the same relationship with their Mahouts total experience. So again, we saw an increase um, in their immune response when their Mahouts were more experienced. Uh, but both of these um, effects aren't very strong, uh, but there does seem to be a sort of tendency there. Okay, so to summarise, because I think that's been a lot of information, um, we overall found that the Mahout system in Myanmar does seem to differ from the assumed traditional system, um, with Mahouts today being younger, less experienced, and to change elephants more frequently than the past. Um, when we then looked at how this, how this might be influencing the elephants in the Mahouts care, we found um, that the Mahout elephant relationship length didn't seem to have any influence on the elephant's physiological stress um, or their immune response. Um, but there was evidence that their muscle damage decreased with longer Mahu elephant relationship lengths, uh, at least for working age elephants. And this may suggest that Mahouts are able to re reduce any harmful effects of work once they get 
know their elephant's behavior and their capabilities. And finally, we saw that the Mahout total experience, again, didn't seem to influence their, their elephant's physiological stress, but more experienced Mahouts or elephants of more experienced Mahouts showed higher muscle damage and a higher immune response, which is possibly due to more experienced Mahouts being involved in these harder working tasks, but it could also be reflecting Mahout damage, uh, sorry, Mahout complacency over time. And um, so overall, I would like to say again, I think it'd be really interesting to look at these similar questions in other populations under different management systems uh, to see whether these relationships, for example, are more important when there are fewer um, experienced mahouts around or when elephants are working in different settings with tourists or in other management settings, as well as investigating the, these questions in other areas of Myanmar as well. I think it could well be different in different areas of the country. Um, yeah, so uh, all of these results can be found in these two papers, oh sorry, in these four papers. So um, the top two are from Carly's talk and the bottom two are from mine. Um, there are also our Twitter accounts if anybody wants to follow us, uh, the group Twitter accounts and website. And to just say that a couple of members of our group, Oceana and Martin will also be talking on this channel in a couple of weeks time. So OCM will be talking again about the Mahout relationships, but how they influence elephant behaviour. And Martin, I think, will be talking about elephant personality and sociality in the MTE elephants. So thank you for listening. Um, both me and Carly would like to thank all of our collaborators and co-authors. I would like to particularly thank all the Mahouts for being involved in the research. And we'd both like to say how much we're really thinking of all our friends and colleagues in Myanmar at the moment with the current situation. Um, and thank you, John, for inviting us and Janine for putting us in touch with you. No problem at all. Thank you very much, uh, Carly and Jenny. Nice to see a picture of uh, Dr. Kain and Mumu and Kin and Tuza there, uh, friends of ours as well. And yeah. With the, from the target training side of things. Um, I'm going to start with with a bit of a question because it's um, I, I, I appreciate the statistics that have have ironed out a lot in there because you've looked at a lot of relationships and I'm I'm, I'm just always hesitant to you know, having having worked with Mahouts off and on now for the last twenty years I'm always hesitant to I, I wonder if the reason why some of the patterns you were look you you weren't looking for you expected to find weren't there was just down to the variation of the character of the mood um, that is so, so varied. Um, and a, a great deal of experience doesn't necessarily mean, um, it, the, the hoot complacency you touched upon a little bit there, but also doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good mahout. Um, in fact, I of wonder course, yeah. if, did, did you find, did you find, or did you find that sort of have a, have a theory of it, but maybe some of that maybe to do with mahouts with the longer relationships had, grown up in an older time and had been and I have I've seen this in Thailand I haven't seen enough in Myanmar's know if it's true there but had been had learned if you like bad habits um I have known uh it, one of the one of the things we do here is taking taking lots of mahouts and, and try to um because the need for um discipline on the elephants the need for accuracy in our elephants what they do is much lower than if they were in, the, say, a logging industry or a trekking camp or anything else. And it, we found it much easier to train the younger mahouts to to not be so disciplinarian, whereas the older mahouts tend to be very, very stuck in their ways and, and um, not not as easy to retrain, if you like. Uh, did you do you think right complacency? I think you touched upon it as well. But did you did you did did you ever? feel that there was perhaps some bad habits that have become ingrained in the older mahouts and that might be it. that might be one of the reasons why your longer relationships showed more muscle damage and things like that. I mean I think that's definitely a possibility. I think it's a it's a, so complicated it's really hard to obviously generalize. Um, and I think I'm sure that is the case. Um, but I think also in in Myanmar because because the the people who are training the younger mahouts are also the experienced older mahouts. So I think they also pass, they, they pass on that um, however they think is the best way to do it. And I think actually for, for mahouts who don't have as much experience, they so, sometimes don't necessarily want to um, 
make their own minds up. So they would just trust what um, a more experienced Mahout was telling them. So I think it really depends actually. I think it could be, could could happen in, in less experienced Mahouts and in more experienced Mahouts. And I think actually the more experienced Mahouts are more likely to be making up their own minds as well um, than necessarily the Mahouts who would just be taking the word of a more experienced Mahout and how to do it. But I 100% think that it's more complicated um, and I, I don't know how how you'd actually look at those things. Um, and what we've tried to do is sort of look with a, a big enough sample size and sort of to, to generalize and just quantify yeah. these things. But I think they could definitely be really interesting to look closer um, and in more detail at those kind of things. But I don't, I don't know how you'd go about doing it necessarily. Um, but I think you're definitely, I'm sure it's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, second, uh, Birgit. Uh, Jenny, would you like to unmute yourselves and ask the question? No, uh, no comments. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Megan. <laughs> um, and then we go to the Facebook, where I think we only have... Um, uh, where do we go? Tim is asking... Asking if it's mentally distressing to, to have an animal in captivity when it truly belongs in the wild, um, and is there a way to is there a way to measure that? Um, That's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to answer this, Carly, or have a group effort, maybe? Um, yeah, I guess. I guess it's something that's not really either of our specific area I would say looking at uh, mental sort of function and emotion and feeling um, and I guess I none both myself and Jen maybe Jen shout at me if I'm wrong but we the system that we work with with Myanmar elephants I don't think we could answer that with them either because they're not fully captive um, because they do have this free roaming behavior at night so they're as close to a wild system as you could get and still be managed, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that's a big question that needs a lot of debate and a lot of input from different people, really, I think. I, I, yeah, I was going to say as well. Yeah, sorry, you go, John. No, no, no. Um, and, and also, I suppose it would be, it's, um, it's, it's got to be remembered that living in the wild is not unstressful. Um, maybe the mm. Myanmar... Maybe the Myanmar enterprise of or the Myanmar example of actually having uh, having elephants in the wild at night able to make their own choices, but also know where their next meal is coming from, could seem ideal. But then they have to go off and do logging, which is going to be stressful. I think the question is, uh, unfortunately, Tim, the, the question is far too complex to answer in a uh, to answer at all. I think, and there's a long debate and everything <laughs> else. It's more more than one PhD there. Um, but yes, I, I think that Definitely. that's. Uh, it's, it's a good it's a good point and it's something we it, it, those of us if we're going to continue to have elephants in captivity um, it's, it's a debate on, of, all of its own as well uh, that we should certainly be looking into oh there's Hannah as well I'm just noticing yeah. lots of people I know and Janine hi Janine I was talking to Janine as well <laughs> um, and I think that's the own oh we, and so uh, Tim also asked and I think your study probably because you only worked with elephants that had lived lived in if you like semi semi captive so with the nighttime foraging but he asks also is there a longer lifespan longer life expectancy working within nature than working outside as in compared to semi captive compared or to, captive I, populations compared to wild uh, the... I think Captive populations working in nature compared with captive outside, I, and I think that's not really in the scope of your study. But could you hazard a hazard a thought? Well, I think for sure the um, lifespan of both wild and the semi-captive elephants is a lot longer than the lifespan of zoo elephants in general, um, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> um, and I think that's quite actually quite rare for for species. So I think generally species have longer lifespan in um, zoo settings but actually elephants are one of the um, exceptions to this yeah I think there was a um, study maybe I think it was by club et al and it was 2008 um, I could be wrong but I think they they looked at exactly that um, yeah. and I guess it's a good point as well is that it's really hard to estimate for wild populations fully because you're only going to get opportunistic 
data really on on different individuals so it would be really hard to get an accurate idea of what what definitely is a lifespan of a wild elephant yeah i mean we see a lot of the old elephants with teeth problems which tends to be sort of um how the elephants would uh, die of old age in the wild right but um i'm sure there's the effects of work also um have have negative impacts yeah but we do see a lot of ele older elephants with teeth issues Yes, which, which is so thank you very much, yes. And I think some of the zoo studies are also a bit conflated by EEHD and the juveniles dying quickly. And so yes, again, a, a big question and um, something that uh, I, I tend to think with very little evidence, though, Tim, that uh, that um, elephants. Well, we, we've done it. We there are other benefits for the elephants psychologically and um, physically to be living close to nature and living within their natural habitat. And we were discussing a couple of weeks ago on this about how how, how the ability to choose their own fodder is, is very important and they'll choose in, in with access to habitat they'll choose somewhere over 100 species of fodder whereas if they're taken out of the wild they may only get three and things like that so so if, if I, i'm a firm believer in if you're going to manage elephants to give them access to the natural habitat and hopefully that uh, that helps it shows either in their lifespan or in the quality of life Okay, that's a really question. great point. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> another question from next next um, next week's speaker, Jake. Um, Jake is asking: Is there opportunity for new mahouts coming through? Uh, a viable point to for new teaching methods to get away from bad habits. So, I guess, are there opportunities within within the structure? As you say, normally they are mentored by an older mahout, um, are there opportunities to teach them other ways or new, newer ways of um, looking after elephants? Um, I know the answer to this one as well. <laughs> but. Um, well, yeah, because I think in, in Thailand there are more sort of mahout workshops and things like that, is there, like active teaching? Um, but I, and I think in Myanmar it would definitely be a possibility. Um, and I, I, I think it probably would happen but it seems actually that in Myanmar I think there is still enough sort of of that passage of knowledge and um, without having to have these arranged sort of teaching workshops and things like that um that there does seem to still be enough uh, teaching in the system that they do have uh, but I know that in other countries that that has definitely happened where there's been more, more sort of organized teaching um yeah I don't know if maybe that's sort of what you're going to touch on is it different to tourism based elephant keeping maybe to the MTE working elephant? Maybe there's some differences in there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that tourism is held up as a great demon, but it's, it's, it's a very varied mm -hmm. thing as is, as is all logging. I think, uh, having, having course, done workshops yeah. for, for different, different, we, we workshops for different um, training methods, particularly in our case, target training, but also worked with um, Andrew McLean and uh, his uh, human elephant learning projects. Um, it, what, the, yes, Thailand is coming on a lot in workshops where teaching healthcare and uh, basic first aid for elephants. Uh, what I've always found in Myanmar, what I always liked in Myanmar, and possibly because we were working with Dr. Kain and then she turned up and people said something, people did things, is the sheer enthusiasm of the Myanmar Mahouts to learn new techniques. So when we went on a target training, every, si every single one of them was, was there videoing everything on their phone. Now, whether they went home and looked at it or not, or not, I don't know, but there wasn't one at the back. There wasn't 10 people at the back going, this is not what I'm interested in. Whereas I have to say, if we do try that in Thailand, um, sometimes we have difficulty holding Mahouts' attention. There are There is a greater, a great, greater chance of fewer people paying real attention. So um, I... I, I, there certainly, to answer Jake's question, there's, there certainly are chances to do it, and that both AGLP and our own target training workshops are, uh, seem to be very effective. And, and in Myanmar, um, particularly MTE, because they're government boats, I'm not sure about the privately owned elephants, but the MTE can actually recruit people to the workshop and send them to the workshop and tell them they have to learn this technique. Um, and the, the enthusiasm of, of the moots they sent along was, 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 in my opinion, um, higher than what I've seen in other countries. That's interesting, yeah. And, and they definitely do have, they have a lot of training workshops and things like that, that 
So the vets go to, the mahouts do go to, and they do have a lot of that training. Um, and I'm sure a lot of that is about also the logging work and not necessarily just um, the elephant keeping, but it's all it's all in place there yep. uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I would just say that that same enthusiasm extends to the vets as well in uh, from whenever we've been to the field. You can definitely see that. Yep. Yep. Great. Um, mm. Camilla is asking, um, thanks for a great live session and a question for Jenny. Did you include visible physical injuries acquired during working sessions to the Mahout experience level? So did you look, did you look for wounds and do a wound score or something like that and compare that to Mahout experience? We, we didn't know. Um, so we would usually be there when these measures are being taken and we could actually look at these, but we, we didn't um, include that, no. Um, and just anecdotally from when I have been there, you do occasionally see these wounds and things like that. And we do, we do sort of note them down because we wouldn't necessarily be in the camps every time that all the measures are being co collected. We haven't didn't systematically look at that, no. But it would be interesting too. And it would actually be in the log books of the elephants as well. Um, so it's something that we could sort of retrospectively look at as well. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, it's a very, very nice Thank to hear from you. Thank you for inviting us. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks uh, no very problem. much. And, I, and I'm glad to hear your colleagues are going to come in two weeks' time because they haven't said yes to me yet. So <laughs> no one's right to me and say yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, don't, yes. don't hold us to that. <laughs> oh, um, we will I... now. There's no escape. <laughs> um, yeah we'll encourage them thank you, you very much and i'll drop them a line after this as well um and so all that remains for me to say is to do is to say thank you to the audience for listening and thank you to our sponsors the anantara golden triangle where i'm sitting here up in the bar i'm possibly about to have a beer although i do actually have to go back to work so maybe i won't this time um and thank you to to everybody for uh, for helping organize this um, for those of you who want a slightly less structured introduction to elephants in the chat, we do do daily live streams here on Facebook, one at 7.30 in the morning and one at 4 p.m. Um, in the weekends, we will be doing educational live streams as well with, um, with the team to show you how we manage our elephants, including some of the HELP techniques that we do from time to time and some target training and things like that, um, and some Thai language which we'll come across. So if you, if you would like to have more um, less information or less less professional live streams and also to get things when we do go with our eleven professionals please do like our facebook page which i gather you are now on and make sure you sign up for the alarms um, until 7 30 tomorrow morning all that remains for me to say is goodbye and thank you very much for watching um, and thank you very much to carly and jenny and the entire crew that they're thanking here for uh, carly and jenny for coming and speaking and for, for, for putting putting a face on it but all, all the people behind them for, for making it happen Thank you very much, everybody, and um, see you, me, and those on the live stream, see you at 7.30 tomorrow morning, and for the rest of you, we'll see you this time next week.